Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Galatians chapter 3 as we continue our study through Paul's letter to the churches in Galatia. Um, as we've been mentioning, as we've been going through our study, that Galatia was not a city. It was a region, kind of like San Diego County. So Paul's writing to a group of churches in this letter, dealing with some things because he had, he had established these churches in what he calls the gospel of grace, which means you can't earn your salvation. It's all the grace of God. But after Paul started these churches, some other guys, false teachers came along, these Judaizers, trying to get them to go back to the law, trying to keep rules. And you have to be a Christian by, yes, believing in Jesus, but it's Jesus and keeping the law. Now, if your salvation is just, I've repented and I believe in Jesus Christ, and that's it, you're golden. That's it. But anytime somebody says it's believing in Jesus and, and then you fill in the blank, you're in danger because that's a false gospel, you know. And uh, so the Galatians, they're being drawn down uh, away from the gospel of grace by these false teachers. And I guess what you could call their gospel of law. Um, but really, Paul said in chapter one that that's really no gospel at all. It's only good news. That's what the word gospel means. It's only good news. If Jesus does all the work, because we can't do it. And so as we get into chapter three, now Paul's going to really start laying it on the Galatians. So, uh, hey, if this speaks to you, take it. But if anything, he's laying it on the Galatians. We get to kind of eavesdrop into it. Um, but I think there are some real dangers that they fell into that we can fall into as well. Um, and if you're taking notes, uh, there's kind of an outline for this chapter uh, two sections. Verses 1 through 14 is the first section, which we're going to look at. And if you want to give a section for verses 1 through 14, it's the law's inability to justify or sanctify, actually both. The law's inability to justify, it, it can't make you right with God, and the law can't sanctify you. It can't make you more righteous and more holy before God. So he starts off really heavy with them in verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth crucified among you? This only would I learn of you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? So he starts off in verse 1. Don't you love that? Oh, foolish Galatians. <laughs> I like to look at some different translations too. And uh, the J.B. Phillips, I find, is an interesting translation with this verse. He says, oh, you dear idiots of Galatia. <laughs> but he's actually pretty correct because this word foolish, it means thoughtless or unmindful or the Rick Green translation, just plain stupid. Oh, you dumb Galatians. You know, it's sad because too many Christians check their brain at the door, right? They, they think, well, the so-and-so up front said it, so that must be the case. Or, you know, here comes a guest speaker. Well, that must be the case. But you don't think it through. Well, that's what the Galatians are doing. And, you know, sometimes people are right that Christians are gullible. And I don't think it should be. I think we should be a very thoughtful people. Worship and love the Lord with our minds as well as our hearts. You know, we don't check our brain at the door. And I think it's important that we seriously think through things and not just follow it because someone else says it. Really, it's like what Paul told the Bereans. What does the scripture say? This is what matters. This is our authority. So here are the Galatians. And Paul's like, you guys are acting dumb. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? This word has the idea of being overpowered or captivated, spellbound. Like, who's put the, you know, you know, you ever see those things where it's like it, it spins and then you like get hypnotized, you know? He's like, who's hypnotized you guys to like check your brain at the door and send you, you know, away from the truth? That you should not obey the truth, he says, before whose eyes Jesus Christ 
has been evidently set forth crucified among you. <laughs> evidently set forth. I like this Greek word. It literally means publicly portrayed or billboarded. You know, Jesus, they didn't actually see him crucified because this is, he's writing to them in the area of Galatia. That's modern day Turkey. Jesus was crucified right outside Jerusalem. And this is about, you know, 30 uh, you know, 20 something years maybe after the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ. But he's saying, before whose eyes? He's saying, come on, it's been billboarded. It's almost like Paul put a billboard that it's only Jesus Christ and him crucified. In other words, you can't save yourself. Look at the cross. Don't you guys already see that? Now, this would be evident every time the believers would take communion. And here, we're going to take communion this morning. That should be a reminder to us that we can't save ourselves. No matter what good works you do, you try to keep the law, you try to keep rules, it's never good enough. Otherwise, why did Jesus have to die? And so we're going to celebrate that later this morning, but let's remember that. Let's take it as a symbol of grace because it's not law. So verse 2, he says, This only what I learn of you. And he asks him a very important question. Received you the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? See, so he's, he's contrasting law versus faith. It's not both. So there are groups today that they feel that the gift of the Holy Spirit is some sort of reward for holy living. You know, well, I was so filled with the Spirit because I finally laid down my cigarettes, you know. Or once I fully committed my life and I said, Lord, I'll be a missionary, then the Holy Spirit came upon me. Well, not so. You receive the Holy Spirit just by faith. And I think Paul's referring here, you know, to uh, salvation, where the, once you give your life to Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells inside of you. He comes to take residence in you so that you always have a helper. You have God himself wanting to come into your life. But also, I think, that empowering of the Holy Spirit where he comes upon a person's life and gives you that power to be a witness and to live a holy life. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by earning him? No. You received him by the hearing of faith. See, the moment you earn something, it's no longer a gift. And there's many scriptures. There's a, I have two written down here, but there's a couple of scriptures that speak of the Holy Spirit as being a gift to us. Uh, Acts 2.38 and Acts 10.45, uh, Peter called him the gift of the Holy Spirit. So how do you receive a gift? You just receive it. How do you receive it? By faith. Just believing. So you, that's how we receive the Holy Spirit. Now, again, you cannot earn the Holy Spirit, nor is he rewarded for a level of commitment or holiness in your life. Because some people think, well, I don't know if God wants to bless me and, and use my life because I, I'm not perfect. Anybody here perfect? Yeah, I'm glad you didn't raise your hand, and I shouldn't raise mine either, because none of us are perfect. That means that the Holy Spirit can be given to any of us because we need him. You didn't earn him before. Why would you think you have to earn him now? Right? So he says in verse 3, are you so foolish? <laughs> Are you so stupid? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? I personally think this is one of the greatest dangers that we face as Christians. To try and perfect ourselves by our flesh instead of continuing in the Spirit. I think that's one of the dangers that the church has seen throughout church history. You know, you, you see, you look throughout church history, and I love reading church history. You see a marvelous move of the Spirit of God. There's a revival that happens. But what happens is then, after a while, people think, well, okay, this is how God worked before. Now let's organize it. Now let's, you know, try and make it perfect, and let's put it in our little systems. But what happens is we're trying to perfect the work of God in the flesh. Um, you know, there's a buzz phrase in the church today called church planting. 
And I'm not opposed to it. I, I think it's a good word. What it means is that you, you start a church in another community and you, like a tree, you plant it there and it grows. And then those seeds go and plant other churches. So I like the terminology, but it's like a, a cool thing now. So what we need to do is we need to get groups of people. Let's, uh, you know, have our network of pastors get together and we're going to assess people, train people, coach people. And, uh, you know, we need to really organize this thing. But you know what's funny, and I don't mean to boast as Calvary Chapel, but a marvelous thing that God has done in the Calvary Chapel movement of churches is that since the late 60s, early 70s, Calvary Chapel's been planting churches before planting churches was cool. But it wasn't like a, well, let's have our program. All it was was people loving Jesus, learning the word of God, maturing in their faith, and they say, you know what? Riverside needs a church like this one. So somebody moved over there and started a Bible study in their home or whatever, and then it grew. And then someone out of that church was like, you know what? We need one in Menifee. So then they go over to Menifee. But it was the work of the Holy Spirit. It wasn't this organ. And there's nothing wrong with being organized. I think it's okay to be organized. But this is the danger. How did you start? By the Spirit. Well, don't try to make it perfect in the flesh. And I think sometimes we do that in our own life, don't we? We think, well, yeah, I got saved. I gave my life to Jesus. I, I was broken and humble. I knew I couldn't save myself. But now to my daily walk, well, I got to read more. I got to pray more. I got to start doing things so that God's pleased with me. Not so. God's pleased with you because you're in Jesus Christ. So why do I read my Bible and pray? Oh, because, Lord, you're so good. I want to know you. Not because I have to, but I want to. If you died for me on the cross like that, how can I not love you back? You know, so it becomes a relationship. You're relating to God based on love and relationship, not based on law, rules, commands. So, are you so foolish, he says, having begun in the Spirit, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? I am so thankful, maybe you are too, that God does not recognize the works of our flesh. You know, when Abraham was told by the Lord in Genesis 22, he said, okay, Abraham, I want you to take your son, your only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and offer him up on a mountain, I'll show you. You say, wait a minute, his only son? Well, what about Ishmael? Ishmael was his older brother, and he had another son, but, you know, Ishmael was a product of the flesh. God didn't tell him to go and have sex with Hagar so that they could have a kid. He did that on his own. But then God said, take your son, your only son. God didn't recognize the works of the flesh, and I'm so thankful he doesn't recognize those things that I do that are in the flesh. He says, forget that. Just, I'm going to bless you anyway because of my grace. Um, and, and why don't you want to trust your flesh? Why don't you want to do things in your, your old sinful nature and your own abilities, your own, um, you know, your own abilities really is what I'm trying to say. Because Paul said in Romans 7, 18, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. Part of spir spiritual maturity is coming to that place where I realize I don't have any resource in myself. You know, our culture tells us we're all good people and you just need to let that goodness come out. The Bible says we're all sinful. And the remedy is not to reform my flesh, it's to crucify it. It needs death. That's why, don't you know that your old man was crucified in Christ? Like Paul said in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So, in us dwells no good thing. And actually, Jesus said in John 6, 63, it's the spirit that gives life. The flesh profits nothing. But Jesus also said in John 15, I am the vine, you are the branches he that abideth in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me, you can do what? Nothing. 
So are you going to improve your righteousness or your righteous standing before God by all your good works and keeping the law? Are you going to be more righteous because of your standard of commitment to Him? No. You're only saved and you only change by the work of the Holy Spirit. And that's just the life of faith. He says in verse 4, Have you suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? You, you see, the Galatians, they were like some of our brothers today, like in China or in the Middle East, that they were suffering persecution. And he's like, if you're trying to be saved by your own ability and your own works, then why are you suffering like the way you are? It's, it's empty unless the Lord's done it all for you. He, therefore, that ministers to you the Spirit and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Right? When Paul was going throughout all these different cities in, in the area of Galatia, he's starting these churches, he talks about how he did miracles among them because it validated his message. That God did mighty things through the Apostle Paul. But he's like, when we ministered the Spirit to you, was it anything to do with works? And the obvious answer is no. He did it just by the grace of God, by the Holy Spirit. It was something that um, was by the hearing of faith. Now, verses 6 through 9 Paul takes it back to Abraham as an example. Now, that's one thing I love about the Apostle Paul, is he's given direct revelation from Jesus, but a lot of it is also pointing it back to the Old Testament. He goes back to the Scriptures. He says, Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And if you're taking notes, he's cross-referencing Genesis 15, verses 1 through 6. And... It says there, just like he quoted, and he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. Now, when you look at the chronology of Genesis, and it's, I love the book of Genesis. You, in chapter 15, the Lord, you know, makes this promise to Abraham, makes this contract, this covenant with him. And he says, I'm going to bless you through all, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed because of you. And it says that Abraham simply just believed. Right? God made a promise, and he said, I agree with your promise, Lord. I believe in you. And what did the Lord do? I counted him righteous. Did he do anything? No. But see, the Judaizers are coming through, and they're saying, well, you have to become Jewish to be saved to these Galatian Christians. You have to be circumcised and keep the law. But when you read Genesis 15... That was before Abraham was circumcised. So really, you could say that was before there were any Jews. He was saved by faith as a Gentile. Say that to your Jewish friends. They'll trip out, you know. <laughs> but Paul makes this same case in Romans 4, verses 1 through 5. He says, what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God has counted to him for righteousness. He says, now to him that works is the reward not reckoned of grace. So if you're trying to earn it, that's not grace, but of debt. But to him who worketh not, but believes on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. See, he goes all the way back to Abraham as his example. Abraham is the original person of faith, the, the father of faith. So he says in verse 7, Know you therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Right? We're all sons and daughters of Abraham if it's by faith, because that's how it is for him. This word children in the Greek is huoi. It means adult sons. So uh, these aren't like little kids. That's, this means that you have the, the full right of an adult son uh, being adopted into the family. So we're adopted in it with the full rights and the full everything of, of Abraham of this faith. Um, this, this is not the Greek word used in other places like John 1.12 where it says uh, uh, you become born ones of God. This isn't like a physical descendant. This speaks of adult sonship. And... Uh, 
sadly, because of this verse, I'm just going to go on a little side note, so take a little side track, that this verse has been used to, um, it's, it's for this doctrine they call replacement theology, which means that uh, the church has replaced Israel on God's plan, um, that God's finished with the people of Israel as a nation and, and their ethnic group, and that the church now inherits all this, the promises of Israel that were made to Israel. Uh, sadly, that theology has made so many, um, it's been so destructive to our world, sadly, through the church. Uh, there's been a lot of anti-Semitism that's come out of that, uh, a lot of damage in the church, um, and it really has fueled a lot of the, the horrible persecution that's taken place against the Jews, especially during the Holocaust. You know, uh, that's where like Adolf Hitler claimed to be a Christian, but he held the replacement theology that God's done with the Jewish people, but he wasn't even saved. He wasn't even born again. But this theology, they base a lot on this verse because they say, well, look, no, Paul's saying that we're all the sons of Abraham. But as we're going to see, he's not talking ethnically. He's not talking about the Abrahamic covenant that uh, we take it over as Gentiles but that we get the spiritual blessings that come from this covenant or this promise that God made to him. So just a side note on that. Um, but here's a question along those same lines. If Gentile believers become children of Abraham by faith, does that mean we're what some call spiritual Jews? No. We're not Jews because we're believers. There are ethnic Jews who are believers they're spiritual Jews, right? If, if a Jewish person who is a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they get saved, they become a spiritual Jew. I'm not a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, so I'm a spiritual Gentile because I'm born again. But I'm still a, a son of Abraham. Not by, you know, nationality, but I'm a descendant by faith. So really, there's, there's different groups of people that are actually descendants of Abraham. Did you know that the Arabs are descendants of Abraham as well, through Ishmael? But they don't also get the promises that were given specifically to Isaac and Jacob. Right? They have their own distinct promises that God made to them through Abraham. But there are other sons of Abraham that are not Jewish. And uh, we would be in that camp. So anyway, there's your side trail. Verse 8. And the scripture... Paul says, pointing again to Genesis, the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen, the Gentiles, through faith, preached before the gospel to Abraham, saying, in thee shall all nations be blessed. And of course, he's going back to Genesis 12, verse 3, and also Genesis 22, verse 18, where the Lord repeated it, where the Lord promised Abraham. He said, in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be be blessed. And in there, he's really speaking of the Messiah. He's going to make the point here in Galatians 3 that that seed, that descendant, is singular. He's not saying seeds plural. There's one descendant that uh, is going to bless all the nations of the earth, Gentiles included. And that's Jesus Christ. So Paul pointing again back to the scriptures. God foresaw... He, that's why he would justify the heathen through faith. He preached that gospel to Abraham. Look, Abraham, you haven't been circumcised yet. The law is not even given for another 430 years. So he's making the scriptural point. Look, you can't be saved or even made better in your walk with the Lord by law. There's an inability of the law to justify or to sanctify. So then, he says, they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. You're so blessed. Don't take it for granted. You are so blessed that you don't have to earn God's favor. I know when I started learning these things, when I, I mean, and these are, these are truths that you grow in over your walk. I mean, I feel like I'm rediscovering, have to be re reminded of my standing before the Lord is not based on anything I do. It's all based on his grace. So even when I blow it, and this is where I feel like I'm coming in a whole new walk with the Lord, that when I blow it and I know I, I messed up and I sinned, that's not going to withhold God's blessing from me 
he's still going to bless me because it's all grace anyway. And so I'm learning to receive his promises by grace and not try to relate to him based on rules and law. So it's something that we're growing in. Verse 10, he says, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. See, he's going to explain now, if you're trying to live under the law, this is the reality of it. As many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. So really, you're trying to keep rules, you're cursing yourself. For it, it is written, and again, now he's quoting Deuteronomy 27, 26, Cursed is everyone that continues not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Right? How much of the law are you supposed to do? He says, all things which are written. So you're cursed if you don't continue in all things. Uh-oh. That means if you don't keep everything to the letter of the law, what's the result? You're cursed. It's like what James said in James 2.10 in the New Testament. He said, whosoever shall keep the whole law and offend in one point, he's guilty of all. You might want to read Romans 7 later. That's what Paul dealt with. He said, you know, outwardly, man, I was so righteous. I, could, I did everything right. I didn't commit adultery. I didn't kill anybody. I honored my parents. He goes, but then I got to the last one, the 10th commandment, you shall not covet. Oh, and I realized in my heart, I desired things that aren't mine. He goes, and then it killed me. And I realized I was hopeless before God. You got to come to that point where you realize I have nothing to offer, Lord. Because if you try to relate to God by law, you have to keep everything. So once you blow it, you're cursed. Do you see what he's saying here? So that's why now in verse 11, he says, but, big contrast word, but, that no man is justified or made right by the law in the sight of God, it is evident. <laughs> He's like, come on, guys, look at, this, look at the text. It says you have to keep all the law. So the fact that you cannot be made right with God is just, it's evident. I mean, it's so clear. And now he quotes Habakkuk 2.4. He says, for, now he's quoting, the just shall live by faith. That was in the Old Testament. That's an Old Testament scripture. You know, I, I've been talking to people and, and uh, you know, they ask me the question, well, how are you saved in the Old Testament versus the New Testament? In the Old Testament, isn't it by keeping the law that they were saved? And the answer is no. It was always by faith. It goes all the way back to Abraham. He believed God's counted him for righteousness. How is it in the New Testament? It's by faith. So it's all grace through faith. It's, it's how it's always been. And Habakkuk said the same thing, the just shall live by faith. This is what Paul preached in Acts 13 when he went through Galatia. It says in his sermon, this is what he said, quote, Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man, Jesus, is preached to you the forgiveness of sins. And by him, all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. You were lost. You broke the law. But that's why we're preaching to you Jesus Christ and his forgiveness. He wants to forgive you of your sins. So that no man is justified by the law in sight of God's evident, for the just shall live by faith. You know, it was this scripture that transformed a man back in the 1500s named Martin Luther. He was a, a Catholic monk who was beating himself, literally. He took whips and was beating himself, trying to become more holy because he knew he couldn't be good enough. He read that scripture from Habakkuk 2.4, the just shall live by faith, and it's like the light bulb went on. I don't relate to God based on my performance. Simple faith. And as we believe in him, that's how we're going to live. That's how you live, is by faith. You don't live by keeping rules. And he was set free. And, of course, he tried to reform the church, and eventually they didn't accept him and him teaching the Bible for what it says. And so they kicked him out, and he started what they call the Protestant Reformation. And uh, that's where the Protestant, you know, uh, 
Reformation came from, and that's why you have Protestants versus you know Roman Catholicism now. Um, but anyway, the just shall live by faith, and look, look at what Paul says in verse 12. He's so clear. And the law is not a faith. You can't really get any clearer than that. It's one or the other. That's why it's not faith and law. It's not law and faith. It's faith versus law. It's one or the other. The law is not a faith. He's telling him you can't have both. Because I think some of the Galatians were probably thinking, he's kind of getting out ahead of it, is, you know, what Paul preached, he's right on. Yeah, Paul's right. But, you know, these guys are bringing in the Old Testament. That, well, they're right too. And Paul's like, no. It's one or the other. You might want to write this down, especially if you're a teacher <laughs> or a student. <laughs> God does not grade on the curve, but on the cross. You know, a lot of people, they think, well, you know, as long as I have good intentions of doing the right thing, God's going to look at my performance and my efforts, and I'll make it in. But Paul, he quotes this law next from Leviticus 18.5. This is what he says. But the man that does them shall live in them. He's basically showing you that do it, do the law, do all of it, and you'll live. But grace doesn't work like that. Grace says believe and you'll live. Right? Law says do it and you'll live, but the problem is none of us can do it. <laughs> It'd be kind of like saying uh, there's this gap between California and Japan, and I want you to go swim to Japan that's like keeping the whole law. And you give your best effort, you're not going to get very far. Can you imagine? I, I tell the Lord, Lord, I'm so thankful that I haven't sinned today. I've been such a good boy today. You should sure bless me. And then my alarm goes off to wake up in the morning, you know? <laughs> I haven't even started the day yet, and I already blew it, you know? You're not going to get far. So if you could earn your own salvation, then like Paul said, in Galatians 2.21, then why did Jesus die? He died in vain. The man that does them shall live in them. Verse 13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. This is where the theologians get this phrase called substitutionary atonement. Jesus, God in heaven, Second person of the Trinity, he came down, took on human flesh so that he could take on the curse of the law for us. That's where he becomes our substitute, right? Now, I don't have to pay the penalty for breaking the law. Jesus did that. And this is the most glorious thing. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. He bought us back. He did it. I didn't do it. He did it, being made a curse for us, for, Paul says, it is written, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. And there again, he's quoting Deuteronomy 21, 23. That was something in the Old Testament that in their culture, that if you wanted to show that somebody was cursed, that they broke the law, like some capital crime, they would hang them in a tree for that day to show everybody, look, he's cursed, broke the law. Not part of God's people. Well, they say, and that's what Jesus did. He hung on a tree. He took on our curse. You remember what they put on Jesus' head? What did they put on his head when he was arrested? A crown of thorns. Where did thorns come from? Genesis chapter 3. It was part of the curse. After Adam and Eve sinned, he said thorns and thistles will be on the ground. He literally took the curse upon himself. First Peter 2, 24, the Apostle Peter wrote this, speaking of Jesus, who his own self bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you are healed. Right? He, was re he redeemed us from the curse by taking the curse upon himself because like the word says, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. But why did he do that? 
verse 14, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. That's why Jesus did it, so that every one of us could, by faith, receive the Holy Spirit. We receive that indwelling of the Lord himself, um, being right with God. He says that we might receive the promise of the Spirit. That's what Jesus talked about when he said in John 14, this was the night of the Last Supper. And I, again, thinking about how we're going to take communion. This was on the night of that Last Supper. Jesus told his disciples, I will pray the Father, and he will give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and shall be in you. The promise of the Spirit. Verse 15. Now we come to the second section of this chapter. But we're going to stop at verse 14 because we are taking communion this morning. Um, I encourage you to read ahead verses 15 to 29. But if you want to know what that heading is, is the law's relationship to God's plan and man's need. So what is our relationship to the law? Well, he's going to go on to say that the whole purpose, and I'm summarizing because we're going to dive into it next week, but the whole purpose of the law was not to make you righteous. It was to be there like a mirror to show you that you're not righteous. When you look in a mirror, can the mirror do anything for you? It shows you your dirty face, right? Or ladies in the morning, you know, you've you got to put your makeup on or whatever. You look at it and it tells you what's wrong, but it can't fix you. That's what the law does. It can tell me I have something in my teeth, but it can't pick my teeth and fix it. That's the law. It's a mirror, but it's never intended to make you righteous. It was there to show you your need so that, like he says, so it would drive you to Christ. So you look at the law, right? Um, don't murder. Well, I've never murdered anybody. But Jesus took it a step further, didn't he? He said, if, you've, uh, if you hate somebody in your heart, that's the same as murder. Or, well, I've never committed adultery. You shall not commit adultery. But Jesus said, if you lust after a woman in your heart, you've already committed adultery with her in your heart. See, because the law, it's spiritual. And I'm carnal. I'm sinful. None of us can keep the law. So when you see your need, and the only thing you can do is fall on the mercy of God. Lord, I'm so sorry. That's what repentance is. It's turning around. I repent. I change my mind. I've been going against you, Lord, but you know what? I want to go to you. That's repentance. And then you just fall on his grace, say, Lord, please forgive me. I'm a sinner. But he's so gracious and he's so loving that he's willing to forgive you of everything you've done wrong. Amen. Romans 5.8 is one of my life verses. God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So when you take communion this morning, if you're a believer, we have an open communion. If you take communion with us, don't feel like, well, I can't take it because I've been a bad boy or a bad girl. The question is, are you a believer? If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you've received Christ into your life. You don't have to be perfect to take communion. We're acknowledging that we're not perfect by taking communion because it's the grace of God that he went to the cross for us. When we Talk about the bread being his broken body. He did that out of grace. I didn't earn it. When we take the cup, we thank him for the forgiveness of our sins that we've been washed, not because we earned it. That's his grace. So we're just such a grateful people. So, you know, I encourage you to take communion this morning in thankfulness and gratitude and just worship because, Lord, we do not deserve this. We don't deserve what you did for us on the cross. But look at what he did. He took the curse for us. So that we don't have to experience separation from God for eternity. So, again, we have an open communion. If you're a believer, we're going to pass out the elements. Partake with us if you're a believer. Uh, if you're not a believer and you've never received Christ... We ask you just to let it pass. No one's going to judge you or look at you funny. It's for believers only. Um, but I want to give you a quick opportunity that if you've never fully given your life to the Lord, 
or you've never been born again, this could be your first communion. You could take it with us if you become part of God's family. So let's all bow our heads, close our eyes. I'm going to pray, and uh, the worship team is going to come up. But with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if you acknowledge your need before Jesus that you need to be forgiven, and you've never taken that moment in time in your life where you receive Christ, know that your sins are forgiven, this could be the day to do that. What you need to know is that Jesus died on the cross for you personally. If you were the only one in this world, he still would have gone to the cross, taken on human flesh and went to the cross because he loves you that much that he would die for you. And that's what he did. And then he was buried. And then the third day, though, he conquered the grave. He came back to life. And he's been changing our lives, so many lives, millions of lives ever since. And, um, but he offers you that free gift of eternal life. And if that's you, if you want to receive the Lord, you've never given your life to the Lord or made that commitment to, to be a follower of Jesus and you want to receive him into your life, just raise your hand. I want to pray for you this morning. Anybody want to give your life to Jesus and know that today's the day I need to be right with him? Praise the Lord. Is there anybody you say, you know what, I've been trying to relate to him based on laws and rules. I've been trying to get him happy with me. Well, today's the day to surrender that. And if that's you and you want to rededicate your life to the Lord, or even if you didn't raise your hand and you want to commit your life to the Lord, just pray something like this in your own heart. Say, dear Lord, I admit that I'm a sinner. I know I need forgiveness. I don't deserve heaven. I don't deserve to be in heaven with you, Lord. But I thank you that you died on the cross for me and paid for my sins. You, you were my substitute. And I receive that gift of eternal life. Lord, please forgive me. Please come into my life. Give me a fresh start. Make me a new creation. And Lord, we ask you to help us to follow you until we see you face to face, Lord. And Lord, I pray even now as we are preparing our hearts for communion to, to remember what you did through the, the bread and the cup, Lord, as we look back and look at the cross. May your love and your worship just fill our hearts to overflowing. And Lord, we would just give it all to you. We bless you, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.